Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Mark Calabria, Senior Advisor to the Cato Institute and formerly Director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency and Chief Economist to Vice President Pence. Welcome back to the show, Mark. That's terrific to be back, gentlemen. So you accomplished something uh, pretty unique for uh, for true blue libertarians uh, in that you actually found a position in government where a lot of us are sort of I mean, I think I might burst into flames if I worked in a government and, and you evidently did not. So uh, so how did you do that? I mean, it wasn't the first time, of course, but before Cato, but, but how did you find yourself in these positions? A, a great question. And while I, of course, am very, am in, very encouraging of having you know, more libertarians um, you know, serve in government, because if, if you don't, I, I'm sure somebody else will and they, and they won't be as good. But I would be the first to say that I think the number of positions uh, that a libertarian would probably feel comfortable and can make a difference in are, are going to be limited. So, so you know, certainly unlikely to think you're going to find a libertarian who's going to run DEA well or be successful at it, for instance. Um, now, as you somewhat alluded to, I had served in government before. I had spent seven years on Capitol Hill in the Senate Banking Committee. And I found myself in the unusual position of having written a lot of the statute that created the agency that I went and further ran, uh, which was FHFA, the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Uh, and the reason that I was comfortable with it, and, and, and I will get into this and at the risk of a little immodesty, say that I think I did actually a pretty good job, uh, is because I had a clear sense of why the agency should exist. Uh, and that is, you know, in the financial services realm, if you're going to have the government come in and create moral hazard, either via explicit or implicit guarantees, then you have to have a regulatory structure to offset that moral hazard because you've clearly crowded out private sector offsets to that moral hazard. Uh, and so what I think made me an effective uh, head of FHFA was I very clearly understood that's what we were trying to achieve. It was the second best objective. You know, obviously the first best objective is don't create government guarantees and moral hazard to begin with. But if you kind of can kind of accept you start from where you start and this is where we are, then I think you can kind of take those jobs. And again, there are a number of other jobs in government, I think, that do kind of fit that mold. But again, I'd be the first to say that there are lots of agencies in which I probably would have not been the best choice. What does this process look like? Like you, you just get a phone call from someone in the administration saying, hey, you're up? Or do you throw your hat in the ring? So it was a bit unusual for me, as, as, as Trevor alluded to in my bio. I was already at the White House working for, for Vice President Pence, and maybe I'll give a little background on, you know, how did that happen, if you wonder? Um, and so the way it really came about, and it was basically a phone call, that someone I happened to work with on Capitol Hill um, 20 years ago when I worked for Phil Graham, uh, a gentleman who had worked with me in the Phil Graham office, who later worked for uh, then Congressman Pence, who was chair of the Republican Study Committee in the House, uh, he was tasked as part of the campaign on putting together the domestic team. So quite frankly, I'm sitting here at my desk at Cato, um, you know, some a friend who I usually grabbed lunch with every six months or so, phone rings, and of course, I think he's just calling to catch up. I answer the phone, hey, how's it going? And he's like, are you interested in being the chief economist for President Pence? And, and quite frankly, that's how it happened. Um, that's how the process started. Um, I did try to be extremely transparent uh, about who I was in terms of a libertarian and, and, and made them very clear. In fact, I would probably say I've never been in a job interview where I try to give somebody more reasons not to hire me. Because, um, again, just wanted to be transparent about who I was and what my, my background was. Uh, but again, it was you know my friend, Darius Meeks, who I used to work with in the Phil Graham days, who worked for Pence, who pulled me into that world. and. And that's how I got in the White House. Interestingly enough, while at the White House, I felt early on that a big way I could have an impact would be in the recruitment of personnel. So I, I very much in 2017 early, you know, threw myself into the to the personnel process, got to know presidential personnel well, and helped them vet a number of, of nominees. And some of it was quite fun. I, I got to offer, you know, Yelena McWilliams, who's the current chair of the FDIC. Uh, I got to, you know, call her while she was, I believe, uh, in the supermarket, you know, over the produce aisle and offer her over the phone whether she'd be interested in being an FDIC chair. And of course, there's some other people 
I recruited as well and really did try to make sure that we had generally uh, market friendly people. So for instance, you know, I was involved in some of the recruitment for the Federal Reserve and I would ask the the, the, the nominees, you know, what, what do you think about bailouts? What do you think about monetary policy? And so we really did try to craft um, getting people in place who were very skeptical of, of government interventions. We could probably have a different conversation on how that turned out with some of the Fed nominees or where they're at today. With that said, uh, I got to know the personnel people pretty well. And so as a way of background, at least until I was there in the Collins Supreme Court decision that FHFA was an independent regulator with a fixed term. So when we came in, when I came into the White House, uh, former Congressman Mel Watt was still the director of FHFA, had two years to go. And uh, when you got to the point in, let's see, I think probably summer of 2018, when we knew that Mel Watt's term was going to be up uh, in January of 19, that there really began an internal process at the White House. Uh, and I was immediately reached out to as, you know, Mark, you worked on the statute, you know these issues, uh, would you enter the running? And I was uh, one of five. I mean, I, I also had the very unusual situation of knowing that there was um, competition and at least two of the five I knew. And in fact, uh, the gentleman I ended up hiring as my number two was one of the other competitors for the job. It's sort of a team arrivals effect there, if you will. Um, but, you know, once that had been the case, I certainly pulled myself out of the process, you know, in terms of doing policy in that area. Uh, and, you know, there was a vetting by personnel. Uh, there was a vetting by NEC, National Economic Council. They ran the process in terms of interviewing candidates. So obviously I was not involved in the interviews of the other candidates, but I did know who they were. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, and of course the vice president really um, leaned in on my behalf. Uh, and really made a very big effort to get me involved. There were other candidates, I and mean, Secretary Mnuchin had a candidate of his own that he advocated for. Uh, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, I won out uh, of the of, of that competition partly because I think there was a feeling of that I knew the issue. Uh, they knew I would try to take a hard stance on trying to fix Fannie and Freddie. Uh, knew I was a principled person. Uh, certainly, as mentioned, uh, you know, did work on the banking committee, which was the committee of jurisdiction that the nomination would go through. So there was a sense of, well, you know, I was probably the most free market person that could get confirmed simply because I, I knew the process. You know, and by contrast, you know, I, for instance, I wouldn't consider myself maybe any more or less uh, radical than our friend Judy Shelton. Uh, and we know that her process for the Federal Reserve stalled. And again, some of that just happens to be that I worked in a large number of nominations. I knew how to I knew how to get to the committee. I'd gotten people through. Obviously, nothing was ever guaranteed until you're there. Uh, and so that process again began summer, I think June, July of 2018. Uh, I very much remember September 14, 2018. Uh, President Trump signed the uh, decision memo to carry forth on my nomination, and that's when. You know, the FBI search and everything else starts. So they don't really do the FBI. They do a political, if you will, vetting. The president decides they do an FBI search. Uh, my nomination actually got delayed a couple of weeks because they had to pull off my FBI team to work on the Kavanaugh background. A little bit of history there as well. You may remember there was a big demand to re-litigate that issue. So that delayed me probably two weeks while they pulled off some of my FBI background team. Uh, and then, they weren't concerned about you being into jam bands? Yeah, the, you know, the, oddly enough, it never came up, you know, uh, and you know, there was never questions about, you know, you know whether my, what my favorite Dark Star uh, version was or, or whether I was more widespread panic or fish guy. But um, all that said... Uh, these, are, these are the policy questions that matter, Mark. It, Come it, on. It, it kind of truly is. Uh, I mean, who's the best basis for Metallica would be pretty much the only question I would ask. Yeah. <laughs> Cliff Burton, but you know we can argue back back in the day. Um, what are they on? Four different bass players, but that's a whole different. Like that. uh, yes, they've gone through a number. But uh, all that said, um, you know it really was a process uh, where the president made the decision in September. Um, you know there was a back and forth. Uh, there was some conversation over whether I should be um, nominated officially within 2018. 
And, you know, the feedback we got from the Hill was the clock was running out. Um, and therefore, the intent to nominate was done in December of, of 18. The official nomination was made in January of, of 19. I was actually, thanks to my friends in PPO, listed as nominee number one. If you go back and list, you know, my nomination was the first one that went up to Congress when the new Congress started in 2019. So we talk a little bit about that back and forth because... You, the conversations that happen between the Hill. So, so first of all, you mentioned, you know, the, the, the people on the Hill are telling you, you know, we're not going to get to nominations. Uh, so like who's talking to the White House on that? And then secondly, after the nomination goes through, do you just go and meet with everyone and, and try and win their good graces on the, on the committee to try and make sure that, that they don't think you're, you know, at least a rat, a radical. I mean, you have to do some amount of lobbying and business. Let me get to that point second and just talk about, so it's a combination of the committee offices and then the leadership offices. And that's in this case, it was, was McConnell's office. And then the committee office at the time, uh, Mike, Senator Mike Crapo uh, of Idaho was the chair of the banking committee. And so, and, and as you remember, if a Congress ends and a nomination is still outstanding, it all comes back to the White House. And because the composition of the Congress is different. So for instance, you had members like Bob Corker of the committee who were retiring. And so there was a sense of, well, you know, if we were going to do a hearing in November and we weren't able to get floor time before the end of the year, we have to start the whole process over again. Um, for me, I was actually willing to do that. I mean, I was willing to, you know, do another hearing and, and do the process over again, despite all of that being relatively painful in some ways, which we'll get to. But the sense we got from both the banking committee and from leadership was that it was extremely unlikely that setting my nomination up in beginning of November, which was in 18, which was the earliest we could have done it, you know, would have been able to get it through in time. That because of the end of the Congress, which again, this is very different than say the end of a session, because the end of a session, you you know, as you know, the Senate is a continuous body. The end of a session, you still have the same members. So even if you have a, dis a December hearing and the nomination comes back up, well, you've got the same members. There's no need for a hearing again. But for me, they would have to do it all over again. And, and the sense was, you know, they just weren't going to be able to make it happen in that timeline. So that's why the nomination was sent up at the beginning of 19. Um, certainly my hope had been that we could have gotten it sooner. But, you know, things, things that work out how they work out. Um, and certainly the FBI does a fairly thorough, extensive background check. Um, you know, they do. A I didn't get a call. <laughs> I was, I, I did. Do you know if they watched the parking lot movie though? This is the, the, uh, that, yeah. that, that actually, well, I do know that there is a, a young man in presidential personnel who had to watch all 300 some of my Cato TV appearances and had to read all of my op-eds and uh, his yeah, name is, his, his, his name is Justin. So we should all say a prayer for Justin <laughs> that he had to read and watch everything I'd ever been on. For 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 listeners, there's a there's a movie from the '80s that Mark appears briefly in that heavy, heavy metal parking lot. Uh, was it outside of Metallica show? Uh, Judas Priest. It was Judas Priest. Okay, so see, I was I, see, I feel like All that blend like, together that, for you, you, you kids. I of course, but the, the, I feel like you know, I mean, hopefully, I don't. I will never be nominated for anything, but there might be some movies that would never want to you know come up of me at concerts. So <laughs> anyway, so they went through your entire record, yes, and called your mom and your, your, your sister. Very extensive. They dig into you know your travel history. A lot of it they dig into your written history. So quite literally, uh, uh, you know, Justin, the presidential personnel, had to read everything I ever wrote, had to watch everything I ever appeared on. Um, and that that's a process that takes time because he's doing it for other nominees at the same time. So they're really trying to vet through things. And of course, they ask you and, you, and you're always best to be very candid about, you know, are there things that could come up that could be embarrassing? You know, and I would, you know, I, of course, I'd say, well, I, I do know Trevor Burris. I don't know if that's going to be an obstacle to nomination. But, you know, they would go through and say, how you handle this? Uh, and then let's fast forward a little bit and say the nomination was submitted um, and, you know, then the committee has some questions, so there's a committee questionnaire, uh, and then a hearing gets scheduled. And, and luckily for me, my hearing was Valentine's Day in 2019. Um, and so usually you try to do as many meetings with members, you know, as you can. And, and even though the partisan environment we were in, I felt very strongly that I wanted to offer every member of the committee, which I think at that time there were 21 members. I wanted to offer every member of committee an opportunity to meet with me. 
Um, and I think before the committee hearing, I probably met with you know, 17 or 18 of the members uh, across the aisle. Uh, and many of them, even ones who had no intention of ever voting for me, were very pleasant and cordial and glad uh, you know, that I met with them. And, and, and again, had a number of, I think, very good meetings. And you try to understand where, you know, what objections are going to be out there. And again, you know, there, you know, I have, you know, people went through a lot of my background and there were questions about like, well, you know, Mark, are you going to get rid of the 30 year mortgage or, or this or that? I think this somewhat going back to kind of my libertarian perspective, you know, I'm at heart what I think of as, as you lawyers would probably say, an Article One guy. And this gets into kind of how I ran the agency, but also I think how I got confirmed, which is, you know, my view was always, okay, it's one thing to take an academic think tank perspective in, 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 you know, blue sky, blank piece of paper. You know, my perspective as a regulator was um, my agenda is simply follow law. You know, this is the law where it's not clear, okay, there's going to be some discretion, but where it is clear, you know, the decision's been made, and it's not my decision to, to preempt that or rewrite that, or even to try to take a creative interpretations of it. It was certainly my perspective, my perspective, was plain letter of the law. And so I think that a lot of members did derive some comfort from hearing that, um, you know, while I may, may, may not be fans of Fannie and don't, be any afraid, don't think you should have created them in the first place, that was a decision that ultimately rests with Congress. That was a decision that Congress made. Obviously, I feel like Congress should have made a different decision, but it wasn't my job as a regulator to make that decision. This this raises something our listeners might be wondering about, which is when we see these hearings, you know, we see the public side of them, but when we see them, they seem very political. And it's, you know, it's people, it's people just like, this is more of a comment than a question. And, you know, everyone seems to have their minds made up. And we have a whole media ecosystem that has taken sides on the nominee. But is there actually like, can you move the needle with people? Like, are they actually open to being persuaded or are like, so is there, does anyone change their mind during these hearings or during these meetings? So yes, they can. And so uh, I guess I feel safe saying this now since, you know, I've, I've got the job and I'm out of the job and it's all behind me. Um, we were able, I think, very early on to create a perception of inevitability that, you know, partly because I was working for the vice president, uh, I had worked for Senator Shelby, who at that time was chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, and as every senator knows, it's good to be on good terms with the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, and so we had really early on just kind of helped create this public perception of inevitability. But, you know, there were a Republican or two that I think actually grew on the fence that we had to work on. Of course, if that was known at the time, people would have concentrated on them. And so, for instance, if you're watching one of these hearings and you're seeing some of the kind of members go after me, like, you know, it's important to keep in mind, like, you know, Democrat Senator Menendez was probably one of the tougher people on me in, in the hearings. And I would probably say, quite frankly, the only meeting I had that was even borderline unpleasant. Everybody else was quite cordial. Uh, you know, even I had a great meeting with Cinema and Brown and many of these people on the committees and, and were very cordial. And it's just important to remember, and I had the benefit, you know, I worked on the committee for seven years. I, I, I ran a number of nominations processes. So I had, I had done so many nomination hearings as a staffer that I kind of knew what this was about. And so I knew that when, say, a Senator Menendez was going after me, he really wasn't looking for me to try to change his mind. He was looking to trip me up so he could put like, you know, some moderate Republican in a tight spot. And that's what he was trying to do. And you can do that. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons that, pr that probably Judy didn't get confirmed. Uh, there were other nominees who were kind of tripped up. Um, and again, it's, it's this kind of game. Like one of the things, interestingly enough, that, that, that people thought were a line of attack against me was I had in a couple of, and we can debate the wisdom of this, but during the mortgage crisis, you know, I had did a couple of blogs, op-eds on the issue of strategic default. And I may have once or twice used the colloquial term deadbeat. And so a number of senators, Senator Browning, took some offense uh, at my, that use of the term. 
Uh, and, and and so they went after me on it, and I and I think I handled it quite well by by not backing off of it, but the, but the explaining and defending it uh, in a way that I think it made it that, that was factual, like why I felt that way. Uh, I know it's a shocking thing to some of their listeners, but you know there actually are deadbeats out there. I'm related to a few of them. I can testify to that. Um, and so, how do you handle these? You know, where they want to get you flip flopping back and forth and, and things like that. So they want to try to say that you're inconsistent, or they want to try to say that you're dishonest. And are you? I also had the benefit of you know I had worked on the statute. I had a PhD in economics. Obviously, still have it. You know, I had written a lot on mortgage finance at Cato. So, and I had worked within within the Industry Trade Association. So one of the things I had going for me, there was never, ever a question during the process about my qualifications. There was a sense of, okay, this guy's qualified to do the job. You know, is he crazy or not? That was the, the margin of where the debate was. Uh, and again, because I had been through this and we did a number of, mur- of so-called murder boards, you know, at, at the White House, which is really an important process for anybody testifying. Um, because it gets you used to the environment. You know, you've got bright lights shine on you. You've got people that are going to intentionally interrupt you. Sounds like a moot court for the Senate, for the Supreme Court when I do those. It, it really is. And I remember having to tell my mother, and I felt very, you know, one of the highlights of my life is being able to have my mother sit there with behind me, you know, during the testimony. So I had to say to her ahead of time, Mom, some people are going to imply some nasty things about me. It's don't believe it. Don't get worried about it. Uh, and I'll and I'll also say it was just such a thrill that you know, Senator Kennedy of Louisiana clapped for my mom and you know said nice things about her during the hearing. So as you know, at the end of the day, it's all about mom. Um, and so you know, you really had kind of set up an environment. Um, and again, because I had worked on the committee and knew a number of the members, you know, there really wasn't a lot of hostility. And I would say anybody else who had walked in kind of with my track record and my paper trail. I think would have gotten a much more hostile, um, you know, a much more hostile response. Yeah, it makes sense. So getting into what it's like to run an agency since you did get confirmed, but before we do that, if just so listeners know, what does the federal housing finance agency do? Uh, and, and I mean, since you helped create it, I mean, it, it's, it is related to the financial crisis. Um, so how were things before and what does it, what does it do at least in the statutory sense? So in the simplest way, it's a safety and soundness regulator for Fannie, Freddie, and the federal home loan banks in the same way that, say, the Office of the Controller of Currency you know, or the Federal Reserve are regulators of banks. And so, so you don't touch private mortgage lenders at all? Not at all. You know, I mean, we can debate the broader debate about whether Fannie or Fannie or Freddie are private. I, I believe they are in the same sense that Citibank is or is not private. Um, because again, Citibank itself enjoys a federal charter. Uh, so all that said, you know, your job is to regulate the safety and soundness and make sure that they uh, are, you know, fulfilling the laws. We also had the additional um, um, responsibility that since Fannie and Freddie had failed in 2008 and entered conservatorship, and this is a power similar to what the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation does, you know, that you're supposed to essentially resolve a failed situation, fix it, and get them back on their feet. Again, the FDIC does this all the time, and the powers that that FHFA were given were quite literally modeled. Uh, you you guys, being lawyers, could appreciate. You know, we quite literally took uh, sections 11 and 13 of the Federal Deposit Insurance Act and marked it up. You know, that's what we went through and said: Does this apply to Fannie? Should this not apply to Fannie? Uh, and so, you know, you can you don't really call it plagiarism when you're writing statutes. You, you're borrowing from somewhere else in the law, but that was really the approach. And there was a sense that the previous regulator for Fannie and Freddie, and of course, the federal home banks had a different regulator, so we, could, we merged two regulators, one being the Federal Housing Finance Board, which oversaw the federal home loan banks, and it was created out of the savings and loan crisis. And then the other one was the Office of Federal Housing Enterprise Oversight, which regulated Fannie and Freddie, also created in the, in the out, coming out of the savings and loan crisis. Uh, and so these two regulators were merged. They were partly merged to essentially dilute the degree of capture. There was a real concern with the previous Fannie and Freddie regulator that because this regulator only regulated Fannie and Freddie, that there was a high probability you know, of a sort of cultural cognitive capture of the staff. And I can certainly attest to seeing that. You know, um, and I'll be the and I'll be and I'll admit myself that I think it took me probably, I don't know, five, six months at FHV where I stopped saying we. Reference to Fannie and Freddie, 
And it's just so much the environment within FHFA that, you know, particularly other, I think because of my predecessors, but just the, the, the conservatorship you know, really reinforces this. And unfortunately, this is very true across the financial regulators where there's a high degree of identification with the entities that are regulated. And it's, in fact, one reason why, you know, and this is certainly we saw a little self-serving to say, it's one reason why I think libertarians, you know, can potentially make the best regulators because of this, because we're not hostile to private enterprise in the same way that perhaps some on the left are. But we're also skeptical. You know, it's that that sort of like, well, you know, a lot of your mainline traditional Republicans tend to be, you know, very much like, oh, well, you know, the private sector, they know best. We're, we're going to let them completely do what they want, um, even with a guarantee, you know. And so you could you could say if you want to very much generalize and simplify it in financial regulation, you know, you could say it's the, the Republicans are happy to come in with the guarantees without any regulation. And the Democrats are happy to come in with the regulation, perhaps with or without the guarantees. And I think the libertarian perspective, you know, and again, I think many, you, you guys certainly know, I did my PhD at George Mason. I, I feel very fortunate to have studied with Jim Buchanan and Bob Tullison and Richard Wagner. And, and so very much a, a public choice uh, student. And so come into this perspective of you have to be very concerned about how private industry or quasi-private industry tries to use the regulatory process to benefit itself. So it's really a, it's not a hostility, because again, not hostile to private enterprise, but it's a skepticism over what does private enterprise want to try to use government for. And, and again, I think, unfortunately, you do tend, at the risk of generalization, you do among Republicans and Democrats get one extreme or the other, where there's just a hostility to it. Or there's a complete like, well, you know, you guys are right. What, what do we know? Um, and so I think I brought the right amount of, um, you know, balance to it where we weren't trying to, you know, stuff out Fannie, Freddie or, or the mortgage sector. But we were certainly skeptical. Uh, certainly, I was skeptical of whatever anybody was telling me, you know, partly because I worked on the Hill. And I do think as a regulator, you have to have an appropriate skepticism. And maybe I would add, I mean, at the risk of, um, I don't want to quite read too many personality traits into libertarians, but I do think one personality trait of most libertarians is skepticism of like, well, you know, I might not be sure about what the answer is, but I'm also not really sure that you know what the answer is. So I'm going to listen, but I'm going to do some research. And, and I think that really kind of helped, you know, the way I ran the agency and approached the, the, the stakeholders. How many people are at the FHFA? Um, so when I left, about 700, um, which it's a, a, for an agency its size on its par, that, that's not unusual for a financial regulator. Of, of you know, we, we were regulating a $7 trillion footprint. And so when you come in, there's 700 people there. I suspect most of them are career people. Like there's probably not a huge amount of turnover. Okay. And so you come in as the new director like, what are you then expected to direct? Like, what is your day-to-day -day job if all of these 700 people have been there their whole careers and are, you know, they know what they're doing? Like, what's your powers and what's the what's the responsibilities that fall directly on you? Great question. And I should caveat, too, that it was about 700 when I left. And, and this may surprise many people as, as me being a, a, a former now Cato guy again. You know, I actually increased the size of the agency by about 150 grew government, but with the objective of shrinking government. Uh, because to me, if you don't have the adequate regulatory structure, you'll end up having Fannie and Freddie blow themselves up. So we certainly just had functions where um, you didn't have the staffing on it. And, 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 and so therefore, we were missing you know, blind spots. Um, so all of that said, A, coming in and trying to figure out what the agency was missing. So for instance, th there was no research division there at all. Um, this may shock you. So, you know, if you keep in mind that all the entities that FHFA regulated are involved in the housing market and the mortgage market, FHFA did not have a group of people who produced independent, like, house price forecasts. We, they, they took what Fannie and Freddie said. So there was a heavily reliance on, on the regulated entities. So, for instance, I thought, like, we need to build out a team there. And uh, I hired Lynn Fisher, who was at AEI at the time, uh, and really just tasked her with, you know, set up a research division. 
you know, let's let's get. Let, and again, there were some economists there spread throughout the program offices. I'm also a big believer that you know what what economists you had doing some evaluation work at FHFA previously were within the program offices. And I, and, I, and I don't think it's a radical thought to say uh, none of us could be objective evaluators of our own work. And at least trying to have a little bit of insulation where you had an independent um, evaluation function within the agency evaluating what the other parts of the agency were doing. I mean, did it get fully independent? Is it already going to be fully objective? No, but it's a lot better than, you know, having the people who do the work oversee whether the work you know functions or not. So trying to figure out where, what resources we need to build out, uh, certainly de deciding the uh, direction of the regulatory agenda, prioritizing the regulatory agenda. I mean, again, most of this was certainly within the realm of Congress. But so, for instance, we were doing a rulemaking on capital. Uh, and this was something that Congress actually told the agency to do in, in 2008. And so I would laugh a little bit when I would occasionally get questions uh, during the rulemaking process. Like, why are you rushing on this capital thing? And I feel like, you know, Congress told us to do this 10 years ago. I don't know that 10 years to do a rule is rush, and, you know, in terms of, um, you know, when Congress expected it to be done. Uh, so trying to build out, um, you know, the structure. And of course, I came in and there was this um, weird situation where all of the profitability of Fannie and Freddie were being swept away so they weren't building up capital. Uh, and so trying to essentially fulfill the mandate and the statute where uh, you would fix them and get them out, and of course engage them in Congress. Um, and then, of course, I was only there 11 months when COVID hit, and that really took over a lot of, you know, the agency agency agenda. Just um, keeping the mortgage market going and playing our role in that in that response really took it over. So, to some extent, you know, what the job is. And again, I would say pretty regularly that you know I didn't actually do anything; I just directed other people to do things which, of course, requires you to motivate them to do other things and also to be pretty clear about what you, what they are to do. And, and, you know, and, I, and I think I got to a pretty good point where, you know, most of the staff, 90% of the time, would not even have to come with me a question. And they were able to, like, say, this is what the director's going to answer to this. Um, because I do think, you know, and this, again, is perhaps a uh, trait of libertarians, uh, you know, there's, there tends to be a, 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 clear, a clear set of principles. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people in government don't really know why they're there. It, it's just a fact. It's certainly been my an empirical regularity of my interactions with people over the years. So I had a very clear sense of this is what we're trying to achieve. Um, this is what we're going to do to achieve it. Uh, I projected that very regularly to the staff, uh, regular emails, all staff meetings. You know, we'd get up in front of the staff and take questions and explain what we were trying to do. Uh, and I'm very much a believer that, it, you know, successful management does entail a very large amount of repetition. That you just need to say it over and over again. And also reminding the kind of the responsibility. Um, you know, I would remind the staff pretty regularly uh, that if they don't do their job, Danny and Freddie potentially fail, which is really bad for the economy. Which is really bad for families and communities, and you know many of them they, they understood that they could connect to that. They might not have always been motivated by saving the taxpayer money, but they certainly remembered the financial crisis, you know, and remembered that you know a foreclosure or a massive downturn in housing prices is quite devastating to families and communities, and and that they could relate to. So some of this, you know, and I, and I think this is also you know some libertarians are very good at this. This is probably why. I often say that my second favorite libertarian organization after Cato, of course, was Institute for Justice because they just do a great job at picking cases that you can relate to. And so part of successful management, particularly in the federal government, is communicating in a way that people can understand and relate to. And this is why I do think libertarians are often very good. If I could channel our friend Arnold Kling's kind of, you know, three languages of politics, you have to be able to know how to speak to, to non-libertarians. And of course, maybe there were a few libertarians at FHFA. I'm certain that there were, were a few. I, I, I go as far to think, I think any substantial length of time in the government should be enough to turn you into a libertarian. But that said, you know, uh, having to speak to the language that, you know, that the staff would, would relate to was an important part of it. I was That kind of got to what I was thinking, because on a more of a policy side, aside from 
what you wanted to do, which you kind of said what you want to do when you got in there. Maybe the best way of asking this is like flip it around. What what would someone who poorly ran FHFA like? What 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 could yeah, F- do that. <laughs> yeah, but like what could FHFA like within even the powers of a of a Bizarro Mark Calabria, like like the ability of it to destroy the housing market. I mean, it's a seven trillion dollar footprint. How much is that of the total housing market as a percentage? Probably about sixty percent of the overall house, housing market. Okay, so that's a lot. So, like, if they, I mean, are you? I mean, is there an adjusting of infant, like interest rates and stuff, or you no, could just? Not, uh, not so. I mean, to some degree. So there are fees that are charged, guarantee fees. There are the credit box. So one of the things that I inherited, uh, you know, Mel Watt, who had been you know my real predecessor, had really opened up the credit box. You know, really increased, or, or in my my sense would be decrease the quality of marginal credit that was coming into the door. Uh, and obviously, he didn't have any capital at Canyon Place. So you mean he, he sort of increased the amount of lending to people who maybe should, who were too too risky, which is a lesson that we should have learned, I feel like, in 2008. You would have thought so. Uh, and, and of course, they you know carved Fannie and Freddie out of a lot of the rules. This wasn't actually in statute, but the CFPB had made a decision. Well, essentially, what the CFPB had done had de- was to delegate to FHFA the responsibility for enforcing Dodd-Frank mortgage rules on Fannie and Freddie. And essentially, the approach of Director Watt at the time was to say, well, whatever you're doing is okay. We trust you. So there really was no enforcement of that delegation. And we started to do that when I came in and said, you know, like it or not, the law is the law, and, and we're going to carry it out. We're going to make sure that Fannie and Freddie you know, aren't driving a race to the bottom in credit quality standards in the mortgage market. So one of the immediate things I did was start to improve the credit quality. We, we cut in half the tail risk. Uh, and I'll, I'm very proud to say um, the two years, two and a half years that I was director were the highest annualized increase in African-American homeownership rates that we've had since we've been keeping annual data in this country. So the lesson being here, the conventional wisdom in Washington, of course, was that you can't increase homeownership unless you, you know, weaken underwriting standards. And I think we showed you can. you can. You can have healthy outcomes. You can have more sustainable outcomes. And ultimately, it's better for the families involved. I think it's, all, it's easy to forget because of the size of the bailouts that the foremost victims of the 2008 crisis were people who were lured into government loans that went bad. And, you know, there's often this sense of it's a government loan. It's got to be good. You know, the government would never get me into a bad loan. Uh, and so I think a lot of people were, you know, lured into that with that that false sense of security, and obviously, just massively devastating. You know, and for my friends on the left who care about, you know, social equity, you know, in at the top of the bubble last time, say around 2006, 2007, uh, if you were an African American family, you were three times as likely to be a home buyer as a home seller. In fact, the top of the bubble was probably one of the greatest wealth transfers from African Americans to whites ever to happen in American history. And it was all engineered by U.S. mortgage policy. So again, I wanted to make sure we didn't repeat that. Uh, not that we are necessarily doing this for to, you know, to, to, to offset racial uh, problems that had done in the past, but really just did not want to set families up for failure, regardless of their ethnicity. Uh, and we had just seen this devastation before. How, I guess, ideological or partisan are the people within these agencies. Like, obviously, there's the political appointees, but most of the people working there aren't. Um, Do they have a side that they've picked and then they dig in when it's the other guys in charge? Are there there people who are like, no, you know, like, they push hard against ideological positions? So it's a great question, and and certainly at FHFA. And I think this is true, certainly at the financial regulators, but many agencies. And that while, of course, by their voting and contribution patterns, they, they you know, tend to be partisan Democrats and lean that way, they first and foremost see themselves as professionals. That, that is their identity. And so certainly in their identity, they would probably tell you or would absolutely tell you that, you know, politics is just, you know, a, a separate from their jobs or, or incidental to their job and that they are a professional and that they were doing the job in question. Uh, and I said pretty regularly and, and, and very sincerely mean and, and do mean that at our town halls and such that I saw my job is empowering them to do their job. And 
It particularly was the case, as you can imagine, most sort of stakeholders, industry, advocacy around town really don't want there to be a good safety and soundness regulator for Fannie and Freddie. There's really no constituency for that. Uh, and so therefore, there's no congressional sympathy for that. So I think one of the things that made me an effective leader there is, you know, both in word and in deed, my job was protecting the staff from outside abuse, essentially, and allow giving them the room to be able to do their job. Uh, you know, one of the more bizarre instances early on, I forget the, the subject matter, but the career staff were briefing me on a particular issue. I made a particular decision and someone in the room said, you know, you're going to get a call. And of course, I puzzled asked, a call? And I said, oh, yes, the CEOs of the companies will call you. And so apparently it had become regular practice at FHFA that the CEOs of Fannie and Freddie, anytime they didn't like anything the staff did, they simply called the director and got it overruled most of the time. Uh, and so I'm a very big believer in, in management style of you yourself are not effective if your surrogates aren't viewed as credibly. So I very clearly, I mean, I, one of the first town halls sat up in front of the entire agency and said, I have your back. I will never overrule you in front of the entities we regulate. If I got a problem with you, we'll go over here in private. And I'll tell you where I think you're wrong. Uh, and that was always my way with any of my staff, the, the, the political people I brought in as, as well as the career people. And, uh, you know, and again, you know, there's something called the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey, which is a survey done every year of the federal agency. And then just questions about, you know, that the career staff were asking, these were over 90% response rates. And they would ask, you know, those senior leadership, do you trust them? They have integrity. And we increased all those things by over 20 percentage points, obviously, on a 1 to 100 scale. And it really was because it, we, I very clearly and regularly projected to the staff uh, that I was there to help them do their job, to insulate them from political fights. I took the political fights on so they could do their job. Uh, and I think if you, and again, this is to go back to the earlier part of the conversation, certainly this is not going to work at every agency. You know, and, and if, you, if you go in and you're incredibly hostile and you think the agency should be set down, well, the agency is not going to agree with you. Um, and so... Because what people knew that I was trying to do was to bring the credibility of the agency up. Uh, you know, another example, as you may know, FHFA as director, I sat on the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is chaired by the Treasury Secretary. And I remember driving back from Treasury one time, and one of the career people saying to me as we were coming back after the FSOC meeting, and her response was, you know, wow, it's just so so great to be able to go to these meetings and be respected as an agency. And clearly that had not been the case before. So the staff understood, and you could get it, every one of us, you know, not everybody gets to work at Cato, so gets to work at the greatest place in the world, but everybody wants to work somewhere that they're proud of. Everybody wants to work somewhere where they feel like they make a difference. And I think if you're going to be able to try to, you know, get the career staff to move along with you in a direction that is that is more market enhancing, more libertarian. You have to speak to that. You have to speak to how are they an important part of it, how it is consistent with the mission, and how is it consistent with, with, with their identity of themselves. So, you know, I, I think, again, I was able to accomplish and move the staff pretty much. Again, do we have a few people here and there? Probably. But I would say we had very few leaks. Um, you know, you did not read on a regular basis in the paper what I said at our town halls or, or to staff. Um, we had, like I said, our, our employee surveys, we did focus groups were off the charts, um, and because we listened. And so, you know, and one of the things, one of the last things I did, uh, I'd come in really wanting to sit across the table from every employee at some point, and COVID hit. So we did, um, we did virtual coffees of, of 10, 12 people at a time. And you know, before I left, I, I had a, I've had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with 675 people at the agency. And so, you know, they knew that I was there to, to, to you know, I, they knew at the end of the day that I was going to make a decision. And I'll say one of the really refreshing things we heard was just happy, how happy people were that we made decisions, that I made decisions. There's a lot of politicals of either party, you know, they, they don't, really, they either lack the courage to do the right thing. You know, I, you know, I, I looked at it and said, Congress created this as an independent agency, and that's what we were up until Collins. The reason that Congress created this as an independent agency is that we could make tough, unpopular political choices, and I was going to do that. You know, I, I was not going to worry about 
whether people were going to love me or not or what the press were going to say about it. You know, we had a job to do and we were going to do that. And I was going to empower the staff to do that. And I think that all worked out quite well. So did you get the, the you mentioned the call from the CEOs and this is a broader. Well, they question. called me all the time and I would feel, and, but, and I but, would tell them when we, we, you know, sorry, you know, you, you know, I think they quickly <laughs> got disappointed that they couldn't get overruled the staff anymore. Well, you said, yeah, you don't want it to be hostile to them, but you don't want to be best friends with them. In general, though, within the housing, like finance community, were there attempts to subvert you or undercut you or in certain ways if they were upset? You know, in part, the biggest part of it was certainly last year where there were demands for a, a bailout of the Morgan servicers. And, and they viewed me, even though it was fundamentally a, a Fed Treasury decision, not mine, I was, I was viewed as the obstacle. Um, partly because, you know, we were the ones with the data and, and there was never any indication of the need for a bailout. Uh, certainly, you know, there were, you know, uh, there were a lot of industry participants who are heavily dependent on, on, on easier Fannie and Freddie access for market share reasons alone. So this is, this isn't about the housing market functioning or not. It's about, you know, which lender gets to make the loan. And a lot of regulatory decisions, and this is again, that sort of both libertarian public choice perspective, is understanding that so much of regulation is really about shifting market share among various market participants. Uh, and so I certainly viewed it as not my job to care what anybody's market share was. Um, and, you know, I also, we, we ended up making sure it was very data-driven, very analytical, but we were also extremely accessible. Anybody who wanted to make a case could come in and make a case to me, with the caveat of they actually had to make a case. If it was just whining, that wasn't going to work. But certainly there were a lot of industry attempts to either learn from Fannie and Freddie or from FHFA employees. Uh, and again, that's that's certainly one of the frustrations. And, and I was also you know, very much surprised that I think about a fourth of FHFA staff either worked at Fannie and Freddie at some point. Uh, and which is, you know, it's, it's like thinking the OCC is full of Citibank former employees. But, you know, but, but you, you work with what you work with. Some were quite good. Some were overly sympathetic. Uh, you know, captured to some degree, and you know, you tried to push that in the right direction. But I would certainly say, you know, the oddity is that um, I would say I probably had, I shouldn't even say probably, I absolutely had a much better relationship with uh, progressive and left leaning consumer, like borrower, renter, activist groups than I did with the mortgage industry, without a doubt. Um, you know, in I, you know, the Lo National Income Housing Coalition, for instance, put out a very nice statement when I left about, you know, thanking me, you know, for the work and recognizing the work. And this was a big difference of what I wanted us to do as opposed to 2008. You know, you may remember the stories in 2008 about Geithner talking about many of the borrower programs were simply, you know, foam on the runway for the lenders. And, you know, of course, Bernanke and others would always have these stories about, you know, we're saving Wall Street because we really mean to save Main Street via Wall Street. And my approach was, I'm actually going to put Main Street first. I'm going to, you know, that's the agenda. I'm going to put uh, the borrowers and renters first. Uh, and you know, if the lenders don't like it, that's that's tough. I'm not I'm not here for them. And it did cause a lot of tension because most agencies really do kind of get kind of captured. If you look at like, you know, the credit union regulator, you know, most of its history, it's been a cheerleader for the credit unions. You look at the OCC and, you know, clearly the OCC has spent a lot of its history, the Office of Control of Country being a cheerleader for, for big banks. And, and of course, the, the Fed itself is probably one of the biggest cheerleaders for Wall Street. Um, and so there really was a hope. And it's interesting. I actually had one, you know, mortgage lender tell me at one point during the crisis, he had said, you know, and I appreciate that the honesty said, you know, Mark, you know, we're, we're just kind of frustrated. We thought you'd be a real voice for the industry. And, and, and I said, I'm an independent arms length regulator, you know, and that's that's what I'm going to be. Um, so, yes, there was probably some disappointment because a lot of these non-bank mortgage lenders, they have no they have no regulator in D.C., so therefore they don't feel like they have a voice at the table of regulators. And before I got there, FHFA had acted as a voice for that industry in many ways, partly because that industry is very closely tied into Fannie and Freddie. And so part of the Fannie and Freddie capture of the industry had essentially been a capture by non-bank mortgage lenders. And so, again, when I was not their cheerleader, they were disappointed with that. But again, I, I did not view my role as being anybody's cheerleader. I, I'm a cheerleader for liberty, and that's about it. So the uh, moral of the story is libertarians can do good in government with the right attitude sometimes. 
Sometimes. I mean, I, I'd be the first to say that my set of circumstances is very unique. I mean, I knew the area of law. Um, you know, and as, as lawyers, you guys would appreciate, I would, I would probably drive our lawyers and their general counsel kind of crazy when I would say to them, you know, oh, let me tell you what we meant when we wrote it. <laughs> so, but, you know, so I came in with a, 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 an area of expertise. I came in knowing the law, knowing the policy, knowing the economics. And so, for instance, often what I think kind of scares a lot of people who want to be able to liberalize and push is that you will hear all these voices telling you that if you do X, you know, the sky is going to fall and the market will fall apart. And so because of my history in the area, I had a really good gut instinct of how far we could dial things without it being disruptive. And a good example of this is the uh, then Secretary, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin and I, back in January, agreed to a set of constraints on how much business Fannie and Freddie did in terms of investor homes and second homes, which of course has nothing to do with home ownership. You know, obviously, you know, you buy in that second home in Maine or Miami Beach is not going to change home ownership rate. And in fact, in some neighborhoods, it competes with home ownership opportunities. So you can imagine once we had done that, there was a lot of you know cry from the industry that oh my God, it's got to really shut this down, and no one's be able to get to get a second home again. And you know there goes the economy of Myrtle Beach, whatever. Um, and so I know you guys could already imagine what the actual outcome was. The actual outcome was the rest of the market completely picked up that business as I knew it would. And I do think. You know, you have to have that sense of knowledge that, you know, again, we, we none of us are all knowing, but have enough of an instinct that you could turn this dial and it's not going to be disruptive. Because at the end of the day, you know, the politicians and the public, I think, are convinced by ex experience. You know, you can make all the theoretical philosophical arguments you want, um, you know, why, you know, the Soviet Union failed or why people are skeptical of government nine times out of ten is because they've seen it in practice not because they've read Hayek. Um, and the flip side of that is, you know, if you're going to liberalize, you have to do it in a way where it doesn't blow up and prove to be a disaster, or you, or you end up setting back the cause of liberalization. So I, again, I think I was in a very unique situation where I knew the dials, uh, I had the confidence, I knew the issues, I had the independence um, to be able to do that in an independent agency. So, uh, you know, it was a bit of an alignment of stars. Do I expect this to be much of an opportunity? But I do think that one way libertarians can be really impactful in the future is those with a policy bent should find an area of policy law, really learn that area super well, and then when there's opportunities to be able to serve, you can make a really big difference. Um, you know, uh, as much as I know you and I, Trevor, would, would just love to clone Aaron and have multiple Aarons, you know, the reality is I think that the demand for, you know, Renaissance man libertarians are women who, who know kind of like a whole scope of things. There's only a small number of that. Most libertarians, so, you know, sorry to break it to everybody, you're not going to be able to replace Aaron anytime soon. So become a policy expert. Find an area to dig into get to know it as well as people who work in it and then you know be willing and again the big part of it of course is you're going to serve in government is recognizing you're going to lose more than you win but the fact that you're there means you're going to win more than you would have otherwise Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.